destruction of bacteria in a minute, but uh, the Sogari knows who you are, and since I am pretty much a newbie, I don't know many of you either. Um, I'd just love to go around the table and just have a, introduce ourselves and where we're from, what part of Duke or outside of Duke, and so forth. So please go ahead, Rich. Just in time. <laughs> I'm uh, Rich Schmalbeck. I teach across the street, and indeed on Wednesdays, I teach really, literally until five minutes ago. So Across the street is the Wall Street. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tom Lambert, senior fellow at the Smith Brothers Foundation. Barbara Goodman, president of AJ Fletcher Foundation. Jeremy Cucci, I'm a second year Masters of Public Policy student. Uh, I'm Dana Vitale, I'm a first year Masters of Public Policy student. Hi, I'm Christine Reeves, and I'm a second year Masters of Public Policy student. Hi, Liliana Valle, I'm a second year at the MBA school, at the Duke Law, and uh, focusing in social entrepreneurship. My name is Mike Morseberger, I'm the Vice President of Development and Alumni Affairs for Duke Medicine. Please speak. My name is Lindsay Atkin, I'm a senior public policy I'm Marty Martin. I'm an attorney in private practice representing nonprofit tax exempt organizations. Let's go to Anthony. I'm Tony Fiesto with the program of Global Health and Technology Access here and also the Center for Strategic Planning at Global Society. I'm Charlie Glossop. I teach in public policy here. I want to apologize in advance. I've got to be around um, by 20 and so I'm sorry I don't have to do that. Um, and, and I also want to say one more thing about James Shulman. One thing I learned Sure, this would be great. 
And then as time got closer and closer, I started thinking, what the heck do I talk about? Uh, and I said, I think, you know, parent and pain. And I said, well, I, could I talk about advocacy? And he said, yeah, yeah, you should talk about nonprofit advocacy and the role philanthropy should play. And then um, I started talking about, well, you know, a big effort should be around technology and, and right to know and pushing our sector and philanthropy generally to be talking about much greater transparency not only within the sector but also within government that today there's new opportunities and we should seize some of those. And then um, last week we hit a financial meltdown, I guess, in the country and uh, I started thinking, geez, how do I ignore that? Um, especially when Saturday uh, Treasury Secretary Paulson proposed a massive bailout um, and that is virtually all that has been going on in Washington, D.C. with Congress trying to lead. And all of us probably are trying to think through in our own minds, what's the implications of any kind of bailout for all the work we care about in the nonprofit sector? And I, I, so let me say, I don't know. <laughs> but what, what I wanted to do was start with a kind of weaving all of those things together in the time we have and instead of being sort of a 20 minute lecturette and then discussion, I'd rather just have a discussion and I'm gonna use some PowerPoints to get us along in that direction. So the first part that we're gonna talk a little bit about is doom and gloom. <laughs> and then, um, you know, if you're not prepared for jumping off the cliff, then we can talk about how do we deal with this? How do we tackle some of this? You know, there, there, I don't know if it's apocryphal. There was a story about Albert Einstein on a train. Uh, and Einstein, um, the conductor came along to Einstein collecting tickets. You know, and, uh, Einstein, when the conductor comes by, Einstein starts going like this looking for his ticket. And you know, the conductor's waiting on him and looking around. And, I need the ticket because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, a lot of times I feel like we don't know where we're going. And, and so I think that's the challenge of a seminar like this is to lay out some things that are happening now and for all of us to use our, our thinking caps about where do we want to go and how do we get there. So the, the first, um, I don't have a clicker. Yes, you do. I do have a clicker. It's on the, um, on the table in front of oh, it. Okay. Pretty cool. You know, we, we, um, we as a sector have a rich, rich history of being involved in public policy. It goes all the way back uh, to associations in this country, in the, in the founding of the country. And I think just we could go, and many of you know history quite well. Certainly, Joel, you've written about foundations, histories, and perspective. All, all of us in this room probably have a fair amount of experience with that. What I've noticed, though, in terms of our sector and advocacy is right around the time of the growth of government from the 60s forward, the federal government, Increasingly, we've seen nonprofits get more involved in service delivery or advocacy. There's become, you know, this tension between the two, almost like a divide. Um, and prior to that time frame, they went hand in hand. They were not really separate. Um, associations were deeply engaged in all kinds of social 
concerns and public concerns from local issues to state to federal. In fact, you could probably, every one of us in our special community could probably take every major law, and there's probably, for the most major ones, there's probably some nonprofit involvement in it in some aspect, either the experimentation that led to the law, the advocacy that produced the law. So we have a, a nation that's rich in nonprofit advocacy, and yet you look at something like this, and I think all of us kind of shake our head and go, I know, I kind of know what Archbishop Garrett was talking about. You know, it's okay to talk about charity, but when you talk about change, it's suddenly you're cast in a evil or demonic or some kind of negative light. Well, we need to change that. That's part of why I want to talk about the financial crisis at the federal level, but it's going to have some impact in a broad sense for all of us. Because we do need to talk about change. And so you're going to have to bear with me for some real technical stuff about budget for just maybe five minutes, ten minutes worth, okay? Gary, if you really want to be interactive all along, yes. just what you said just reminded me, you know, Congress has really encouraged nonprofits to get involved in that. If you remember, Absolutely. You know, I can remember back when we had the legal, the legal services programs for the poor, and they were expressly prohibited from engaging, undertaking lawsuits that were designed to change public policy. We had the issue of the well, so that you know, if this is a battle that has been going on. If Congress is perfectly happy to see nonprofits provide services to people who need the services, but in terms of, of, of using the organizations as platforms to make changes to, to improve greater, better distributional equity, Congress is just vigorously opposed to going on. And you haven't even budget for it. And, and, and I think that's a key concern that goes back even a step further than you said. You think back to the Reagan. A precursor to ISTIC, um, which I'll explain what it is, and some of you don't know what ISTIC is about. The precursor was in the Reagan administration, the folks came in and proposed a rule that said if you get federal funding, federal grants, then you cannot be involved in public policy even with your private dollars. And the definition of public policy was extremely broad. Um, that was done through regulation. And a large coalition of many of us in the nonprofit sector stopped it. Um, it came, ISTIC was the same version of that, only through legislation in the mid 1990s. And um, uh, even prior to that, uh, you mentioned doing tax law or covering tax law, and you, you cover tax law issues or exempt issues. Um, we all know that um, there was a law in 1976 that gave powers, if you will, to the nonprofit sector to operate under an expenditure limit for lobbying, which was different than the ambiguous um, uh, test that existed prior to that point. Well, the IRS came out with proposed rules for that 10 years after that point, and they were extremely bad rules, but the good part of that four years after lots of debate with the entire nonprofit sector, they came out with very good rules. The point is that I think, Joel, there is still a chill around legacy chill, if you will. As I speak, nonprofit leaders often say to me, well, isn't there some rule out there that says I'm not supposed to be involved in public policy? And you explain all the things that have happened that that's not true, and they kind of go, huh? So I think that's a legacy. It's just one further uh, aspect of that, though, is, is that there's, uh, with, with limitations on lobbying by uh, charities, that there's the playing field is leveled in a way that it would not be if charities had unlimited ability to lobby. That is, I, I, I have a lot of, um, I'm just full of public policy opinions. I'm free to express them, but uh, to the extent I want to, uh, I, I need resources that they have to come from my own pocket and I don't get any deduction for them. Even businesses uh, do not get to deduct uh, lobbying costs. There's a, a limitation in the business expense deduction rule. Which is so, so the only way you actually could get a deduction for lobbying uh, under 
certain circumstances we can give it to a 501c3 organization that's invested as a charitable contribution and then have the 501c3 organization to keep close. So I think part of the background concern is a sense that, that there's there's a little wrinkle in the in the lobbying election or in the previous, but no substantial part, but actually I think most, most charities have never elected the, the 1976 provision. About 3% now. Yeah. yeah. So, so most of them are just stuck in this ambiguous, no substantial part test. But part of that idea is to achieve this, this level of playing field where nobody gets to deduct the cost of petitioning government for their uh, for redress of grievances. Well, I, I, you know, it, it's it's interesting because of one Supreme Court case that justified the rationale for putting limits on C3 uh, speech. Um, we do have another way of differentiating for-profit from not-for-profit. That is, there is a limit on the amount that the C3 can engage in. Right. Um, so there are differences in multiple ways that you're talking about to the other side, but there's also the for-profit has no limit. Well, under the view I was advancing, charities already get away with a little, and, and arguably shouldn't be allowed to get away with any, uh, because the, even the little bit that they get away with amounts to the potential for lobbying with deductible dollars that is not available to businesses or individuals. Yeah, except, well, I mean, I, let, let me come back to that, okay. because I think I, think I want to debate that okay. a bit. Right. But I think we need some background before we get there. Um, let me go forward with a little bit about the budget, and I'm just going to stand up the point to this chart, um, because there's a couple things that I just won't want you to see. Many of you at the state level, like here in North Carolina, or other states, have had real uneven kind of economic situations, right? State budgets have been cut, then they got healthy, and then it's been limited, more emphasis on philanthropy. At the federal level, uh, we went through a massive crisis, crisis of deficit as a percent of GDP, getting much larger in the earlier part of the Bush administration. And this appeared to be a crisis, and money got very tight at the, at, for federal spending. The projection was that the deficit was going to, as a percent of GDP, get smaller and smaller. And we knew, looking outward, because of demographic shifts that we've all talked about, various forms, starting from right about this point, you start to fall off a cliff in terms of deficit, to the point where it didn't matter whether you were conservative, liberal, or any other stripe in between those, I think everyone agreed this model is unsustainable. Everyone has a different solution to fix the problem. But the situation long term is a thousand times worse than what we're talking about here, okay? Now, add in the potential of a bailout of $700 billion. Let, let's assume that's the number that actually becomes real. That would not get added to any of this. This is annual spending deficits. The bailout that's talked about in Washington right now is talking about adding that to the debt. Okay? So, to explain the difference, this is annual spending each year. Each year, this gets added to our federal debt. And as our debt goes up, we have to pay interest payments on that debt. Okay? So this looks like a pretty bleak picture. Tack on to it that our debt will go up roughly 5% of GDP if we do, if it turns out to be $700 billion. We, nobody knows what it will be. But it certainly appears it's going to be something of a huge magnitude. Okay. Now let me take it a step further and talk about why we're in this situation. In the most of this year, there's been a discussion about Social Security as being way out of whack. But the reality is, and this is data from the Congressional Budget Office, if you look out over the years, and again, this is percent of GDP. Social Security it goes up a little bit, but it's not that it just jumps way out of whack. The next level is healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid. And as you see, the block goes up significantly. This is one of the huge changes that's occurring. Now, net interest, which I just described to you, is the amount off the debt. This is all calculated pre-bailout. So I just told you the bailout goes into debt 
which means these numbers would go up quite a bit. We don't know how much because we don't know what the debt will actually be. But as you see, as you get further out in years, that's going to go down. The rest of this is the rest of government. This includes defense spending. This includes all of what we in the nonprofit sector tend to rely on, which is often called discretionary spending. And what you see here is the revenue that the government has, the projected revenue. Obviously, we hit a problem as you keep going out in years. Very much related to that deficit chart, but this is in terms of program. This is why it's unsustainable for this reason. Something has to give. And in all likelihood, with the bailout, this problem gets exacerbated. This gets much worse. Are you ready to jump off a cliff now? <laughs> this is a bad picture for the nonprofit sector. And obviously, the implications are pretty broad, not just in terms of programs, but who gets the most amount of money in terms of grants from the federal is the states. The states, in turn, pass through the nonprofit who partner up in service delivery of all types. There's going to be, either we go massively more into debt to deficit spending, or something has to give that can go out. Is, it, is that all pretty clear? I mean, this is, this is, I think, what's shocking about our policymakers today is I don't think people are looking five years, ten years out. They're looking at basically short term around elections maybe two years at the, out, at, the, at the most of the outset. Is that all pretty clear? Yeah. Um, well, how, how would the line for the revenue look like? The fact that you had a tax for instance, like you say, Scandinavian countries or some European countries. Yeah, we, you're, you're actually right. As a, as a, it, it, would, it would go up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I should say, this doesn't account for either the Obama or the McCain tax cuts. This is a baseline. Okay, now they're each proposing additional tax cuts. And more programs. And more, well, Obama is much more programs. Well, Obama's tax cuts are not nearly as big as McCain's, but, but Obama has much more on the spending side. Mm -hmm. Does it assume that the Bush tax cuts are made permanent or that they're allowed to last? This assumes that they are um, at baseline, which would be still counting them in. And as you know, McCain wants to increase those. Obama wants to target, keep some, and then target some to middle income. Well, what does that assume about the AMC? It assumes a patch each year, basically, is what the CBO does. But if it's a real fix, it's going to be more expensive also. Or if you get rid of it, it's a big expense. But either, either way, ultimately, that's a hidden cost. That is We've had this alternative minimum tax. Rich, you do it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy. Um, the original idea was that there were a lot of people who had a lot of tax breaks uh, who were very wealthy but not paying much tax because they were taking accelerated depreciation deductions, and so it was meant to be an anti-abuse device. But uh, Congress failed to index it when it indexed the regular brackets. It's failed to make adjustments in the rates when it's made adjustments in the regular brackets, and so now comparison between the alternative minimum tax and the regular tax structure is narrowing and more and more people are actually paying uh, this alternative minimum tax. Even even people of ordinary means who have no fancy investments or anything else. Yeah, I'm pay, I've paid it. Yeah. And now it's personal, right? <laughs> I've paid it the last several years myself uh, and uh, it really ticks me off. But but its, it's budgetary problem is, is sort of illusory. It was never meant to collect as much revenue, but now all of the projections build it in and if you look up at, at what uh, the revenue picture looks like in 2020 with no change in present law, I think the AMT collects more tax than the regular tax, at which point it becomes legislatively difficult to say, just let's get rid of it. Because it's, uh, just, uh, it, it, but it sort of looks more expensive than it is because we'll never actually allow ourselves to get to that point, right? <laughs> we'll have that's to a some political kind of patch, thing. but that's a political thing, right? If you really want to have a lot of fun tonight, go home and spill out the AMT form. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> the, the last one of these, and 
then I'm going to sit down and chat more and inter interactive with it at my new. The obvious implication isn't just that it puts pressure on everything we in the nonprofit sector care about, but it also means that there would be almost an inability to come up with resources to replace those federal dollars. If you took the lost revenue, just assuming the baseline, all I did, and it won't work, these, these numbers don't gel up, but it was just a way of looking forward. What I took was giving, all giving, individual, foundation, all, all the different formats. And I just projected it at the projections for inflation, just assuming it stays at that. I mean, it could be, you could come up with different. My point is that as you look into 2009, this would be the lost federal revenue. This is the current giving. You would have to jump by 142% to replace those federal dollars. It is impossible for that to happen. Something has to give. Something, yeah. Um, just on that note, with, um, with, deficit, with deficit spending and the fall of the dollar, how do you, I don't know if that, that, um, that figure um, includes rectifying international aid efforts, particularly when the dollar buys less and it's not increasing proportionately in response to that figure? Yeah, you, um, the, you, you're wrestling with two different numbers there. One is on the government spending side, it includes all that foreign investment, which is actually very tiny. The U.S. puts very little dollars other than military, into international aid. It's like point oh to point oh seven yeah, percent yeah. of the GDP. It's very tiny. Um, the other side that I was showing on this is just USA giving. Okay, this is not international giving. I have no idea. Some of you are probably far more expert on what giving dollars are international. I don't have a. It's about group. ten. It's about yeah. ten percent of the of the, of the figure here. That is in terms of U.S. giving individually no and others foundations going abroad. It's about 10% of the total. So it's, it is, you know, if you just take the figure that you got for 2009, it would be about $30 billion, 33 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the point is you're, 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 there's, there's a gap here. We have a serious gap, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bailout, you know, I, the question in my mind after doing this, was, and that's why I did it, was what's the implication? Joel and I were talking before the session, what does it do for philanthropy? What does it do for assets, uh, a foundation? What does it do for individuals who are giving? Um, you know, Barbara, you, you, you run a foundation, right? I, I have no, do you have any point of view on that? Do you have any thoughts about impact? charity side the demand is going to get much greater if we can't get money from the state or we can't get money from the feds who do we go to it's going to be either individual giving or foundation giving is going to be the logical recourse and i think the other thing is it's not like we're starting with everything is rosy i don't know about every right, other state right, right. but north carolina we're starting we're already got so many social issues and so many needs and percentage of school dropouts and etc um, prison prisoners. We we don't even we have, we can't even handle that at this at the level we are now mm -hmm. between state, federal, and philanthropic. What are we going to do? I mean, I, I don't, we're not we're, we're, we're we don't get ahead of anything. It, but
but it, I would argue, on the other hand, uh, Joel would have the figures. Um, on the other hand, the run-up in wealth in this country over the past 20 or 30 years, uh, heard Joel speak uh, recently in New York, is, uh, is astonishing. Um, uh, just the total value of the stock market, even with the recent turmoil. And if you look at the assets that have been parked in foundations, many of which have run up, and the, the uh, reality of donor-advised funds and Fidelity Charitable Advised Fund being the number one charity in America right now, where people are giving away the minimum threshold to meet federal requirements, uh, I, I could argue, in fact, that um, not to mention a transfer of wealth, the greatest transfer of wealth in history upon us, even as we speak and during the next 20 years when older generations will pass, you might argue that a true golden age of philanthropy will be upon us in which needs will be addressed in new ways and we will. And do you think, Mike, that the, the recent month of turmoil in the markets and in credit um, will affect that in any way or do you think? Absolutely, that's absolutely. Good? And certainly, you know, the donors that I'm speaking with are at the low end, our direct mail gifts are down. Uh, Average gift has gone from $42 to $36, uh, there's little things. And at the real high end, uh, uh, we're going to take a hit. People we were talking to about million dollar gifts are saying, mm -hmm, let's talk after Christmas or that pledge I made, I need now three more years. I mean, that's already happened. So uh, I'm not saying this will overnight. I'm just thinking in the longer term, um, I, my hope is that things will level out and that uh, – that true benevolence and altruism will continue uh, and, and maybe even increase. And that does require the new wealth to be generous again, to the same extent that old wealth was. And Joel knows a lot more about this than I do. I know that at least there's anecdotal evidence from time to time that it is not as generous, certainly that it is different. It may be more entrepreneurial. That may be good or bad, but it's, it's a different kind of wealth. Well, it, but it's also sunsetting foundation so that instead of doing what the old wealth did and create foundations in perpetuity uh, that pays out which pay out five percent of their asset value they're now you know paying creating foundations that are spending down and so like the foundation I worked at instead of the four billion dollar uh, uh, asset pool instead of paying out uh, five percent of that for two hundred million dollars a year it's paying out four hundred million dollars a year uh, so it is there are forces countering that. The money is getting back in circulation, but it just, you know, it, it, uh, I don't, I don't have any views about it. I have the same. I, my sense is that I, I feel more comfortable. Can the foundations respond to the kinds of needs that Gary's talking about? Probably not. I mean, there's just no way that, that foundation wealth can, in fact, address significantly the, need, the needs that are there. Can foundations continue doing? what they've been doing in terms of, of, uh, of working, pioneering new things, working at the margins, they can. They can't, what they can't do is to pick up the social service, direct service kinds of support that this money has been supporting. They can't do that. They've, and they, you know, they've been they've been complaining about the demands put on them ever since Reagan, the Reagan budget cuts. Uh, and they've gotten much more egregious over the course of the last uh, four years, six years eight years at this point. So they can't do that. And, uh, and so the question is, how are we going to fill those needs? Foundations are not likely to be able to do that. There will be an increase in charitable giving by individuals that tends to go more towards service delivery than it does to the kinds of things that foundations do. But it's a, it's a quandary, and, and, and it's very frightening quandary. Well, I think a lot of what happens, whatever the decision comes out of this crisis, is going to determine where we go. Say actually each of you. <laughs> I think in, in response to you, the, the numbers I showed you are pre-bailout. So this is right. this is. I mean, the bailout can only either. Right. If if the bailout doesn't work right, 
it gets worse. Yeah. If the bailout works right, then the picture still looks like this. Right. That's so that's that's the bad news. That's, right. that's what that's that's why I wanted to talk about this, even though I hadn't planned on doing it, because this is so significant right now. <coughs> this is such a huge issue. I would say also, Joel, in, in to your comment, the other concern I have is for foundations that are the laboratories that do experiment. I don't know how you're going to scale up because scaling up often requires state or federal money. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't know where that goes. Uh, and that has a huge impact for a lot of things the two of you like on social enterprise, which is really about coming up with great ideas and scaling up. Right. Well, I'll put an extra button here and you may have more to say, so I don't want to cut you off, but just to remind folks that within the giving pie, uh, direct service, say in human health services or human services where we find out of foundation giving roughly approximates 15% of the dollar on the dollar. So um, if one thinks that the foundation community will or could pick up some of the slack, in fact it doesn't pick up a hell of a lot of slack to begin with. Right. Um, and so the, the enormous leap Religion is the top. Is always at the top. Yeah, right. and, and, mo and many well, people I know just sort of put that to the side, yeah, yeah. knowing that that's, it's really extra religious giving. Because no. that one is 60% of the dollar. No, 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 no. 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 It's, it, it has been as high as 15%, but it's now 35. about 34%, 30, 33%, 34%. Well, anyway, the point being that those who have, who give in, in this philanthropic or charitable way have the larger largest share of it has always tended to be more pitched toward the rich and what they get than the poor. Mm -hmm. So the uh, rhetoric that talks about, well, the nonprofit sector can get picked up by philanthropy and everything else, in fact, has a double weakness to it. Never happened and never will happen. And uh, it makes the plight that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Since, since uh, um, Carrie threw out through the balls of the social entrepreneur people, uh, I think we should ask Wendy what she thinks about I'm, I, I, Wendy Curran, who's sitting right over there, was the head of the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship in the Pupil School until she got promoted this year <coughs> to be an associate dean of the Pupil School. What do you think, Wendy? Can, can social entrepreneurs help with this problem? Um, <laughs> well, I think social entrepreneurs can help with every problem, really, but they can't <laughs> solve the problem. They can play an important role in addressing any of the, uh, you know, the issues before us. I think you really hit the nail on the head with the scaling issue. That's one of the, there, there, I don't think that a, a capital crisis or a credit crisis will ever stem the sort of creative human spirit and the desire to do something good in an original way. And I don't think that that, I mean, maybe some, sometimes that gets enhanced during a crisis. People get more creative. Um, and people do amazing things. And then to really change the world, they need to scale those things. And that is probably going to be a significant problem. Um, uh, but it's just, so, it's just so hard to know. I, you know, I claim the same uh, ignorance of the future as everybody else at the table. I do think um, there, Clearly, the United States' is a problem that we've created is going to have a big impact on other economies. I mean, we're all one economy, basically. But at the same time, in other countries, they're, um, you know, they're, they're less affected by uh, what's going on than we will be. So in terms of social entrepreneurs needing to solve problems globally, there's probably global capital that will be able to attach to that. So. I was just thinking way of saying what you said, which, which is, yeah, we have more debt in this country. If the 
it's China to buy our debt, and then they have to prop us up because they don't want us to go down. Well, no, that's, that's <laughs> not perverse. That's actually true. <laughs> yes, everybody. Yeah, everybody's got a, a lot of interesting uh, sort of skin in the game here. But um, well, I guess where where I wanted to go here is to see if we all see this as a as a mega problem, and, and I think we all do. Um, and and the one you know one thing, believe it or not, is I'm an optimist. I actually, despite starting with the bleak news and starting with not bleak, really bad news, I think all of this can be fixed. <laughs> and I have the answer. <laughs> I, I, do, I do think the silver bullet, the, bullet, <laughs> the magic bullet. Yeah. I, I think a critical. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think. Um, it, obviously, the path we're on right now is, is not a constructive path, it's not a healthy path. Um, and I think the sector writ large, both from the foundation side, the charity side, the grantee side, the grantor side, I think we operate for far too long in a defensive posture. We, we live in the kind of moment of saying, please keep us going. You know, when Lockheed comes in and says, we need something, they don't say, please. They talk about, to save this country, to protect this country, we need X. Most of us in our sector don't talk like that. We come in sort of, do you think we could get the same kind of funding as last year? You know, can we hold even? And, and usually holding even is a loss because of inflation, because of changes in, in um, population changes and demographics that require further further needs that are unmet. I, I think we've got to get back on talking about big big picture and talking about a proactive agenda to talk about big things again. And to do that, what is hard is that those of us in the nonprofit sector who are taught about our program area, I was trained when I came into about kids and disability. That's my background. I wasn't about public policy. I migrated there because of the implications for kids and disability. And it seems to me that today's world is we have to teach nonprofit leaders and the board members about some of these broader issues that I just was talking about. Because I don't think people are talking about five, 10 years, 15 years down the road. We in the sector, because we are nonpartisan, have the luxury to talk about that. The policymakers are all focused on, you know, getting reelected, whatever that takes. So, you know, there's sort of a joke in Washington that you can tell the politicians, you know, they're the, the ones with the finger in the air because they're feeling which way the wind blows, you know, and, and what our job should be is changing the wind. That's our job. And to do that, that's where I do believe in what you're talking about at the very beginning, and I put it up there, our First Amendment. You know, we've gone to war to protect this First Amendment. And part of it is that right of the people to peaceably assemble, to petition the government. It is the right to lobby that we fight for. You know, and, and those of us in our nonprofit sector, we, we have shied away from this far too long. If we're going to be wind changers, if we're going to really talk about big things and talk about making some change and looking at the big picture, we're going to have to challenge and get involved in public policy. Yeah, Barbara. Well, we said rails as well as, as a Fletcher. We, we both contribute a lot of money you to sure policy do. and advocacy. <laughs> No, in, in, I know. I know you do. And, um, yeah. So we do that, and we have lots, and, and we have we're lucky to have a North Carolina Justice Center and, and so forth. And we also we have lots of workshops going on. We have a nonprofit institute at our university, right. but community foundation for advocacy yes. training, which we yeah. just yeah. had right. one. Right. So we're yeah. we're really fortunate that we have all this going on. Where I where I think we find that we can't make any headway are the individual funders. I mean, we're, we can, you know, we're about it on policy and advocacy. We're pulling in a few people with us, but if, I, if we get funders together or the funders groups, 
can go and, and they're not going there. You know, you can say, well, you're not spending your, you know, you're, you're, you're not making the most of your dollar if you don't put, you've got ceilings up here. That's to me as frustrating as the nonprofit and their boards who say, no, we're not getting into that. I'm already working on my personal thing with the legislature and no way you're doing that. But you can see that with these funders and it's like it goes in one year and out the other. Uh, we, we're not doing it. Well, that, that's the kind, of, kind of discussion I want to talk about is how we to get, get past the hurdles. The nonprofits are well, well, I, I, would, I would disagree with you on that. Um, I, and, and I've got data from this book that we just did that would argue otherwise. Nonprofits can be a whole heck of a lot better in involvement. Yeah, the ones you do. Oh, yeah. Well, are, yeah, are because neighbors. of our what we do, we know those. Right, right. And they, they know their and, support system. And I think we've got to make this much, much bigger. I think we've got to find a way to penetrate the boards, the donors, and the nonprofit executives all at the same time. This is a big item to talk about engaging in public policy. And I and I know Ed in your old role at certain a foundation, you have talked about these kinds of issues for more than a decade. Um, and I know in Atlantic uh, Philanthropies, they just put out a phenomenal publication that talks about the importance of foundations and nonprofits engaging in public policy. It wasn't just part of that, they set up a $250 million lobbying fund basically uh, for that. But this is, but this is happening in other places as well. On the foundation side, you know, you, you've got foundations that are engaging in advocacy in ways that I think still the IRS hasn't yet really passed on, but they're doing really interesting novel things. Like Julie Robertson has, his foundation is, uh, you know, is run by somebody who isn't paid by his foundation money. Uh, it's paid by his own personal money without, not with any tax benefits. Uh, and that they act, they say that, that that frees him to engage lobbyists if he wants to. The Jeff Foundation is another one which created, again, it's got a, a, a 501c4 that they created, which, which is not tax benefited dollars, but pays a quarter of Bob Crane's salary and for an organization called Rocket, and they, they, they hire lobbyists. Um, I've seen that a lot, and it's now with, with, with a number of foundations that are beginning to be very impatient about the capacity of, of the foundations for those who aren't knowledgeable about about foundations are not permitted to lobby generally except in self-defense. But they are really figuring new ways of if the Turner Foundation is the one that's really sort of got the ball rolling with its effort to, to, to reverse the decision in Congress about the UN back dues. Um, so there are there are examples now and I underscore it isn't clear to me that, that if these issues get raised with the IRS, that they will approve some of these arrangements because of the relationships between the, 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 the foundations, the 501c3s, and their lobbying activity is, is, as I've described it, and in other ways as well, questionable. But they're doing it. I also have had, there's a good friend of mine, his name I haven't mentioned, a wealthy individual here, a businessman in North Carolina, who is so has decided that what he really wants to do at this point is to raise non-tax benefited dollars from friends who care about deeply about public issues, and he's creating a kind of a mutual, a pack, a pack basically. Non-tax benefited dollars, but raising money in increments of $5,000 or $10,000 to engage in lobbying on public issues, on the public interest. So that, you know, when people start thinking about doing things like that, it begins, it's starting to happen. I'm not saying it's not a grassroots movement at this point, but there, there are signs of hope. There's a group that just celebrated its 10th anniversary yesterday. You're probably familiar with the Center for Lobbying and the Public Interest, which uh, exists in order to uh, instruct charities about how to do this. Uh, I'm not a vice chair of their board. <laughs> <laughs>
research uh, is, a, is a critically important issue. Organizing is critically important. There are all kinds of aspects of public policy engagement that are without doubt essential to the cycle of social change that's needed, and we fail to do an adequate job. And I will say from the nonprofit side, and this is where I would slightly disagree with you, Barbara, our, this is a great place where I can self-promote our book. <laughs> Um, what this was was research that was done, um, it was empirical research of a, a random sample of IRS 990 filers stratified by those who um, elected under the lobbying expenditure test versus those who were under the substantial part test, and then broken up by those who spent money on lobbying and those who didn't. So we had a fairly robust structure for doing this research. It was complemented by doing a series of focus groups with foundation leaders, with nonprofits, with a host of other players. Um, there were about, actually about 20 different focus groups around the country. And those were also followed up with telephone interviews with some of the survey respondents. So this is a very useful tool. And what it shows, by and large, as I say, if you go two slides forward, that the general trend is charities say that engaging in public policy is essential to their mission, but their behavior doesn't comport with what they say. Their daily patterns are vastly different. They do engage in some form, like testifying. They do something, but it's sporadic, and it's usually defensive, which is absolutely the wrong time to do it. They get engaged at the last second when it's a crisis. And then they drop out. <coughs> Won't that be better if it's done with ribbon? Well, I was going to say that comes in your. Doesn't it have to be done, almost done with ribbon to get the nonprofits to, to move better? It's, it's, it's the money. Well, that's a debate. I mean, I I think what I learned from the research um, is that the barriers that are identified are money, tax law and skills. Those are the topmost barriers. But the research suggests that even if you get rid of those, even if you gave $19, they're going to put the money into program, not necessarily advocacy. And what this showed was until you tie advocacy to mission, we're not going to go anywhere. Our trainings, which have been, I've done them, OMB Watch does trainings, the Alliance for Justice does it, the organization I'm on the board, Clippy, does them, are all focused on the law. And maybe that was the wrong way. Maybe the right way was to talk about more of why. And then once you've got them engaged, make sure they're they're doing it in the you know in a proper manner. Well, one of the things that strikes me in what you said is that if you look at how social change has taken place in this country over the last it has taken place in large part by organizations that created a mass constituency yeah. to get behind particular kinds of agendas. Uh, and, the, and, and that's one area that the, that the nonprofit organizations have really not done very well. They're not, and, and part of it is because they've been discouraged from engaging in that kind of so-called indirect lobbying, basically mobilizing a constituency for the purpose of bringing pressure to bear on legislative bodies. But that has to be done. It seems to me no matter what you do with respect to your experience in, in blocking the district amendment is a very good example of that. You had to mobilize a lot of organizations. I think you're right in that, that it's got to be done not on a response to an emergency basis. It's got to become part of the, of the, of the regular practice of nonprofits that they are going to engage. They're going to do the same kind of organization before crises occur to prevent crises and to solve them when they occur ahead of time in the same way that the for-profit sector does. That is, they really, as, as you would say, they are proactive in organizing groups that will defend their constituencies there in the case of for-profit, but in the case of non-profit, they're, they're mission agendas and, and get, and there are examples of that, you know, you look at what the Peterson, the Pete Peterson Foundation is doing at this point. This foundation is, is concentrating entirely on changing policy with respect to Medicare, uh, 
Social Security, uh, and, and they, and, and, they, and Pete Peterson, uh, it's, it's a billion and a half dollar foundation, and that's all they're going to do. If you, they recruited David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States, to be the president. Uh, they've got a good staff, and that's all they're going to do. They're going to do indirect lobbying, or by and large, on all on issues of government restructuring. So the point is that this is, it's beginning to happen, but it's, it needs, other foundations really do need to get there and just take that. also wanted to respond. The research we did, um, it came up without, was never a question on any of our surveys. It was never even a prod in the focus groups. But what came up was this feeling of retribution that executives and board members especially feared that if you take a public policy position, you're going to get burned. said in the focus group, I would not want to piss off the mayor. <laughs> That's what he said. This was you know, down in Texas. And he said, that happens all the time. And then he went on and said, I know what's going to happen. I'm just going to cut the budget for my organization, and i got a fiduciary responsibility. And he talked just as direct as that. I mean, it was as powerful. And that resonated with just about everybody in the room. You know, one, one person at, at a state nonprofit was talking about that his organization took a position on one issue that dealt with kids. Um, the staff person who was in the state legislature moved over to the executive, and this guy said, our grant got cut immediately. And everyone in the room kind of went knowing there's a sense of impact if you get too involved. And that risk is pretty huge, apparently, to what everyone's saying. Well, that's the history. I mean, you, you have the prohibition you know, coming out of the 50s when nonprofits teed off against Lyndon Johnson and the campaign. And basically, that's where a lot of this got started legislatively. And so, you know, and, and the problem that I see certainly in <coughs> that you're talking about. 
talking about in your first slides is the direct result of too much lobbying, too much influence of lobbyists, and so forth. So, I mean, if there's going to be a backlash of nothing at curtailment, we can agree that that's what the source of the problem is. Who's to say that, well, just because we have a better cause than Lockheed, that we're going to end up any better for having more nonprofit lobbying? Well, I mean, my reaction to that is I'm sure you probably could debate yourself on your own. No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there are at least a couple responses here. One is, we are not arguing for any shareholder interest that is economic interest. We're arguing in the public interest. Um, we don't have a profit margin that we're trying to preserve. Um, we're also quite diverse, and that voices is a captain of the voices. We have conservative voices, we have libertarian voices, we have progressive voices. We have voices that don't have a position on politics. Um, and that's healthy. I think that is part of what pluralism, what, civil, what, what a strong civil society wants to embrace. The second thing is, if there is nobody out there like us, then all of the other folks have a free hand. There's no check. And I can tell you as someone who lives in D.C., a check is just an example, on Saturday, we had Secretary Paulson propose this massive bailout. Regardless of your viewpoint on the bailout, I think one thing all of us can agree, it should not be unilateral control by the Secretary of the Treasury. And in there was language that said that the Secretary can commit to contracts and commit to anything and undo any other law order to do that, whether anti-discrimination, whether open fair competition, you name it. No oversight. no oversight, no review by the courts, by Congress, by anybody, no transparency. That, you know, I think that calls for a number of people to jump in and say, hey, wait a second. Now you have the industry coming in and saying, no, 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 transparency got us into this problem. So I think you need voices to, if you will, balance out. So, so it's, it's playing the game. I mean, so it's, it's not changing the system. It's just adding more people to the system, essentially, from a different viewpoint. I mean, so it's, it, I mean, if you listen to, a, let's say, Obama's campaign, he really focuses on diminishing the role of lobbyists. And so this is this giving the, the social sector a voice in the scheme, which maybe wasn't such an ideal system. Richard, can I jump in though? Yeah. Just before you do, I, I, I want to just say, less to us, all of us on the panel, but yeah, I want to run through the major points. And the, and if, if, if you want me to, I think. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I think we're gonna, okay. we've got the conversation started now, okay. but you've got about a few other points. To come I, so. I, I just, I just so. need to respond to this. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a crime that both Obama and McCain have targeted a, a surrogate, and this is my next slide. It has become a surrogate for the real problem, which is money and politics. Lobbyists are First Amendment, that is motherhood and ample pie. This guy, those of you who haven't heard the name Jackie, he may have permanently in our nation's psyche cemented corruption and lobbyists in one this is a guy who's gone to jail, brought down at least a dozen people in corruption, lobbying corruption scandals. And my fear is that an honorable, an honorable profession, which is speaking out on behalf of others, is now tainted because of that. The issue that's a problem in this country is the confluence of money in politics, not the issue of speaking out on issues. And I think Lockheed should be able to lobby, just as the YWCA should be able to lobby. So that, that would be my comment on that. I am very troubled by the aftermath of Jack Abramoff and what's happened in our campaign today. Uh, you know. Well, not to be cynical, but lobbying doesn't really work without money. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> tied together. Speaking out, absolutely agree with you that that's First Amendment. But the 
who you get to speak to, how often, and what happens next is very tied up with the money. And the Supreme Court has complicated it enormously by defining uh, uh, money, free speech, as spending money. Uh, so that the, the, given the way the court has treated the attempt, the various attempts to control the amount of money in politics, all of which have been uh, gotten around one way or the other, just it, I, you know, I've written on this on that subject. I thought I had the problem solved, but nobody listened to me. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years ago, and it didn't pay him enough money to listen to me. <laughs> 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 you need a good lobbyist. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy, I, I want to actually give a counter to that because right. um, I, 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 I live and breathe on public policy in Washington, D.C. OMB Watch does not have a lot of money, nor do the people I associate with. The Istook fight is a good example. We were up against some big dollars. The reason we won is because we banded together with nonprofits from around the country that spoke about impacting the community. Our strength was the voice of community. It wasn't the voice of money. I can tell you, you may disagree with OMB Watch on our views. We fought against the contract with America, the whole regulatory reform issue. Big, big bucks. I mean, major bucks by companies wanting to change the regulatory system to benefit the regulated industries. We opposed that. We had virtually no money. We ended up winning. I can tell you on another issue, you may disagree with OMB Watch, constitutional amendment to balance the budget. It was supposed to be a done deal, when, especially when, when President Bush came in. We fought tooth and nail. We didn't have the money. We fought tooth and nail. We won by one vote in the Senate. So it's not always going to be true the way I'm saying. I'm not naive, but I'm also fully aware that if we as a community come together, our voice is incredibly powerful in ways that we have not yet really shown. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of big change about budget and why we as a community need to be engaged. From a nonpartisan point of view, we can create massive change. Now, we first have to debate the issues, and we may not all see eye to eye, but we're not even debating the issues. That's the point I was trying to get. Yeah. Why is it so important for you to elevate the um, position of the lobbyists in society? Uh, I don't see why that the perspective that you're trying to elevate the voice of, the, of those who are essentially disenfranchised or whose voices are not represented, or those, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that I would want to tie up that issue with the notion of lobbies as an honorable profession. <laughs> I think that's a losing proposition. Well, not one I would want to back either. It, and, and it seems that there's a tremendous inequity regarding actually how voices are represented by money, which is clearly and what he's pointing. You know, I, I, I just uh, don't see the value of trying to argue that somehow lobbying represents the First Amendment. <laughs> you know, well, you could easily consider many different ways of government engagement to elicit that type of input to the table without having lobbyists per se. You could invite testimony, you could resource um, the voices of those in the community who have to be expressed in any of a number of ways without having a professional lobbying team that looks like Lockheed. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, you, you, you certainly um, have your, your right to uh, <coughs> uh, present it in any manner you want. In fact, our research said we gave the exact same comment to one third of the audience to another third of another, and all we did was change the word lobbying, advocacy, education. Exact same thing about changing a member, getting members to change their views by lobbying, by having. And as you would expect, our nonprofit sector does little lobbying, more advocacy, and a whole heck of a lot more public education. In the focus groups, people were contorted to not use the L word. In fact, one, one person I remember he used the word. Impact analysis. This is, he's talking about going up to a state legislator and trying to get change. He says, oh, we don't do lobby, we do impact analysis. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, your, your last slide, you talked about a, a convicted lobbyist as if lobbying were a felony. I mean, you know, you right. wouldn't say convicted churchgoer. I think, by the way, lobbying, lobbying should be an honor should come up with ethical standards on what are good lobbying. And the organization that you talked about, Richard, 
the Center for Lobbying and Public Interest, with Rockefeller Brothers Fund money, just a few months ago, went to Picantico to a retreat center and spent the time for a couple days trying to come up from a public interest, from a nonprofit point of view, what are those principles? And they put it together. It's on their website. The key complaint is actually that kind of lobbying or advocacy is done without the financial conflict of interest, but it's that which has clearly um, advances financially the interests yeah. of those who are doing this as advocacy. I, I find that the, the uh, distinction that is actually very important to keep separate. I, 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 I'm all I'm with you. I'm just trying to be fair to say I think should lobby, but I, I think that there is a world of difference between um, lobbying for money, for, you know, for yourself or your company versus for a cause. I think it's I think it is different. I think there is something unique about it. Um, I, I had a, I teach a class at Georgetown and I had a, a cynic come in who said um, it doesn't matter. Nonprofits are just trade associations anyways, and so when you come and lobby a cause for nonprofits. I don't see any difference between that and Lockheed. Yeah. So. And I, I play devil's advocate with that because I think that we are, just by the, by the nature of your initial slides, lobbying for dollars as a nonprofit sector. And you suggest that you know, we wrap ourselves in a cause, whatever that cause is, at the root of it is in what part the sector is seeking economic redress in some, in some fashion, either directly into the organization itself or on behalf of the constituency out there. But that's an important distinction. I mean, it's the same distinction that Andrew's making, which is that, that lobbying in behalf of large numbers of needy people is very different from lobbying on, on behalf of uh, institutions that benefit directly from the money. And the more people, and the, it is a democracy after all, and that and that and that the, the, when you're dealing with programs that benefit large numbers of, of people who need support, one sort or another, that's very different. Isn't that right? I've heard this uh, sure. business interests love saying that they are just like the uh, NGOs that work on behalf of public interest, for which those NGOs will never see a dime that actually goes towards them personally. They're doing it on behalf of AIDS patients elsewhere or other people whom there is no financial conflict interest problem. But the, I think the different rules that ought to be in place. I, I, I'm with you. I just want to see more of them. <laughs> Andy, you want to ask a question? Hi. Um, uh, I just had, I know I'm not particularly knowledgeable, but I had a question uh, about if there are success stories, and, and I don't, I, I'm not nuanced in, in, in terms of understanding the little differences between 501c3 and 501c4, but um, I, what comes to mind is um, the March of Dimes, because they are known for advocacy, and I know that they have had success in terms of um, advocating for particular legislation, uh, and they're they, they go all the way from local all the way to national. So what is maybe, I guess what I'm trying to say is, how, how is that different maybe for foundations and what, what lessons can we learn? Is it, is it salience, is it significance, or is it organizational structures and law? That's probably a really broad question, but I guess I just, uh, to kind of look at the policy implications. Um, I think the answer, the answer is on all fronts. For example, within an organization, one of the things our research shows, I mean, it's kind of kind of fun because um, within an organization, who is the person who um, does the most public policy? It turns out to be the executive director, right? Well, the worst person to have doing it is the executive director. And it seems logical when you think about it because the executive director is pulled in a zillion different positions things. They got to do a staff round, they got to do a fundraising, they got to do a blah, 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 blah. So um, internally in an organization, there are things that nonprofits really need to do to structure. One of the most important is having your board engaged. Most boards aren't engaged in public policy at all. And so it seems foreign to them when all of a sudden a staff person comes up with an idea of doing something like so there are a host of things that are laid out that are internal to an organization. But then there are external things. And certainly on the funder side, it's critical uh, to talk about foundation supporting advocacy. Joel talked about a few very good examples. There are others. Uh, Gun Foundation, we have Northern California Grant Makers has a toolkit on their website to help uh, grant it, grant, um, grantors with um, advocacy. There's lots of exciting things 
but they are the unique element. They're so, what did it say? There, there are so few that we can, we can talk about them. And there should be so many that we can't talk about them all. Part of the problem, in my mind, is just as we were talking about mission and having nonprofits better understand the connection of advocacy to mission, I think that we hear the same thing from the foundation community. They have to get the connection between their mission and how their dollars can help get them closer to that mission. So I think there are lots of things. I, one last thing about data. A fascinating thing in here is nonprofits say that foundations, as they get more foundation dollars, they perceive greater barriers to engaging in advocacy. The irony is, as they do get more foundation dollars, they're more involved in advocacy. So the criticism of foundations may be a little misplaced based on this data. said about the Bishop Amendment is a good example of what they can do if they do get engaged. The sad part is that directors are not, the, 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 the boards of directors of nonprofits are not very much engaged in anything. Uh, they, uh, and, you know, there was, just this year, there was a, a study done by, who, who did it? I can't, there was a study that was done of, of, of the, of the uh, directors of nonprofit organizations, board members of nonprofits. Which was? Yeah, no, it wasn't in, but in any event, it was, a, it was an empirical study that was done. It was commissioned um, maybe by the philanthropy awareness initiative. I don't remember. In any event, I've got, I've got it. But the, the, what it showed was that, that fewer than 50%, these are all board members of organizations, nonprofit organizations that receive money from foundations. Fewer than 50% could name even one foundation in other words, they have no idea what the foundations are that are giving organizations giving their organizations of which they're board members money. <laughs> that tells you, you know, it just tells you how disengaged these direct members of the members of boards of directors are, and it's a shame. Right. It just because they because so much of the power of non of nonprofit organizations, by operating charities of one sort or another, is in their boards. And yet they don't really but they're not engaged and they don't use them in a way that really is enable the organization to achieve its mission in very important ways, probably more important than what they could do if they, if they spent their own money. Well, let me, let me stop there. I was going to go a little bit further, but I think this, is the, this was, in essence, the core of the message, which was we have big problems today. And unless we engage as a sector from the foundation side, from the grantee side, to address some of these issues, we're just walk off of it. Um, I, the, the last part of the presentation that I'm not going to do was around roles of interactive technologies to enhance greater transparency and to create greater connection between we the people and our government, which is I think part of the transformative piece we have to go through. I think we have them, which is government, and us right now. And we have to bridge that gap. I think we can. Uh, and there are new things that are that are able to be done. So, yeah. Did you look at it in terms of your book um, or, or your thoughts on most conversation today is really focused on the C3, but there's a lot more latitude by forming C4s or C6s or 5.7s. You better tell everybody here that you don't know what they are. <laughs> C3s are your public charities and they're formed under the code that allows for um, education, religion, uh, scientific advancement. They're typically the or charitable organizations. They're typ the typical, non when you say nonprofit, it's what most people think about. The C4 is a, is a social welfare organization that looks at a broader range of things. For example, a, a junior league might be um, a typical C4 organization. A C6 is a membership organization that um, is a political action committee which is formed for direct political action. Under the IRS code, basically the, the 
trade-off is, is a C3 can engage in, um, in a no political campaign activity and can engage in grassroots advocacy and education. And if, and if you craft it appropriately, you basically can craft, craft and the IRS passes on it, you craft it where there's a lot of uh, latitude in terms of what you can do by way of advocacy and, and uh, education of the public. And, and what you're hearing today, I think, is, is the fact even with the laws that are permitted there, uh, 501c3 do not take full advantage of it. There's, a, there's an election <coughs> under the C3 law that allows those corporations to set up dollar amounts that um, uh, set the limits on which uh, those C3 organizations can commit resources. And typically, most nonprofit organizations, I'm surprised at your statistic that only 5% take the election. 3%. 3% to only take the election because the dollar amounts the dollar amounts are relatively liberal and quite frankly most organizations don't even approach spending the dollar amounts which they could put into direct lobbying. So there's so there is huge potential capacity with what the law currently allows among the C3 organizations. Except for the foundations. Except for found, yeah, except for foundations. Um, C4 organizations, the trade-off is 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 kind of, uh, Contribution, contributions to C3s are tax deductible, chair, charitable contributions, and that's what everyone wants by way of donors. C4s, you don't have the deductibility, but because of, of the contribution that you do for a C3, but because uh, it's a social welfare organization, there's much wider latitude in terms of what you can do by way of advocacy and education, and also some uh, opening up in terms of what you can do by limited campaign activity. Similarly, the same issue with the C6 527s, basically, you, those are set up to do engage in direct political activity. Contributions are not tax deductible to them, but um, they can engage in political campaigns to go after candidates, and we'll, we'll see lots of examples of those on the home tonight and turn on the television and look at about every second or third ad, and it will be probably will be a 527 out there. Um, so there's latitude already within the sector when, when as I sit here and hear about that, that A, there's, I think that there's capacity already there um, that, that is untapped, and so maybe there is an educational component. But there are also other vehicles by which you could look at uh, those organizations setting up in conjunction, uh, either forming different types of C4s or C6s or 527s that really can address those, those issues. And I think the IRS is quite frankly, you know, Some respects, in terms of the ability to do that. Now, what I think is going to be interesting is what's going to come out of this weekend, where the churches um, are directly challenging the IRS. They are C3 corporations or C3 organizations, and they are directly challenging the IRS in terms of um, their ability to engage in, in, in advocacy and campaign activity. And I suspect, in terms of, of what we've talked about today, that. They're going to lose, um, and you're going to see probably some backlash coming out of that, both from a legislative point of view and perhaps from a regulatory point of view from the IRS. I'd be curious, um, Rich, have you been following the, the church uh, activities? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and how narrowly defined is what they're trying to get exemption for? <coughs> oh, you mean what they're doing this weekend? Well, I, just, they, well, I saw well, the headlines and haven't read the story today. Okay.
unless they choose. <laughs> unless they choose to. Unless they choose to to put that in place. The IRS says. The law. I mean, the law say that the taxpayers have the right to privacy, and that from the from the from the uh, individual uh, private tax side that carries over into the exempt organization. They say it does. They say it does. And of course, if you're facing, I mean, these are felony provisions that are against disclosure of, of tax return information, and that's what the IRS side of the Senate said. It can't talk about these things. And, and of course, the point of those felonies was to keep disclosure uh, to, to to preclude disclosure of private taxpayer information. Right. It really makes no sense. In organization area where the 990s and the 1023s are public documents. Don't, and don't. Uh, so, so I think their interpretation of the felony statute is too narrow, but on the other hand, I understand if you're facing a possible felony, you want to be conservative in your interpretation of well, that's exactly that's what the scope of the felony is. I but, mean, that's uh, the, So it needs to be clarified by, by Congress, probably. If, if, if I that's, the IR, I mean, that's the IRS position as jump. head of the exempt organization division. Right. That's what she's right. That's what she's <coughs> about. If, I, if I could just jump in for the rest of us who are here, I think um, what, what's important in the conversation they're having is the definition, if you will, of advocacy. For C3s, we talked about it's important to lobby, and it's important to do research, community organizing, all forms of advocacy. What we didn't talk about is voter engagement. And there are, unlike the lobby rules that some of us in this room worked on to get very clear examples and bright lines of what you can and cannot do. On the voter engagement side, it's not as clear. And the ambiguity has even added more chill to nonprofits, except for those who are willing to take the risk. So this discussion they were having was precisely about where is this line going to be drawn? Um, it, although this example was not a good one of what the church has done. All Saints is the better one. This is a very issue. I think if we, as we go forward in our sector, what we should be striving for five years from now is to have bright line rules like we have on the lobbying rules for voter engagement. We should take the ambiguity <coughs> out. Even if we lose some things, we should be able to say to a C3, you can do X, Y, and Z, <coughs> and a foundation can fund X, Y, and Z, and be safe. That's the part we want to get to. And then if it can't be done, it should be done by one of the other entities you talked about, Marty, a C4 or a 527, whatever structure is the appropriate one. But right now, it's, it's a kind well, of limbo area. Let me just hold it for one second. Um, we probably got about 10 more minutes, and I want to be sure that it's a, as much more as we can talk about can be. I want to make a couple of brief remarks about this. Um, uh, with particular regard to the graduate students who are here today participate, which is there's a lot of um, buzziness and, and code words that come up in this conversation. But I hope that you understand and would really want to invite you to chomp on some of these issues more deeply. They are fascinating. They're the heart of American democracy. And if you and your, if each one brings one the next time and the next time, we're gonna have a very, very robust conversation. So I hope that you'll do that. We will name it the Fleischman campaign. We will name it the Gary campaign. Uh, second thing I want to mention is that uh, when Joel mentioned the Pete Peterson Foundation that was just set up, <coughs> David Walker, the new CEO, is coming to speak here in a couple of months. January. Uh, January. So um, I'm calling that to your attention to uh, keep it in the backs of your minds. We're probably going to publicize it somehow. But uh, again, um, the kind of work that Pete Peterson is doing, has been doing for a while, but now formalized it, is a very good chapter two to this chapter one. Now, it's not the only if issue that we talk about over the course of the year, but given this election year and the issues of the budget, they're really going to be coming up very clearly. Harvey Dale. Yes, the next, right. It's actually the next speaker. Tuesday, October. Tuesday, October the 7th. Right. Uh, and he is one of the smartest, uh, other than people in this room, myself excluded, <laughs> he, is one of, he is one of the smartest lawyers in the country on issues of the, uh, uh, law and philanthropy and nonprofits. And he will be talking both about the, the, the issue of advocacy that we've been talking about and the limits and ways of doing it. Uh, and he will also be talking about international grant making. Uh, because that's something that is very much in the wind. So uh, uh, he 
he's very articulate and very smart. And I encourage you all to consider coming and spreading the word of the law school. There may be other uh, law students who would be interested in that as well. Yeah. Rich, that was my third point. Uh, if we can find a way to uh, you know, uh, publicize this to, to law students, um, I think you're the only law professor here. Um, uh, there'll be some stuff that will do that. Pardon? Well, the one behind it.
some of these, the, the, an example that the foundation letters that come with the grants that put limits on, on lobbying, some of this is you know, over aggressiveness by the wonderful lawyers. You know? um, and, and the excuse of using the Tax Act as a reason for foundations not to engage, I think is now long past and we need to come to grips with that. There's a great deal foundations can be doing. I think there needs to be a, a resurgence of energy is what there needs to be. Yes, um, I interned at GAO this summer. Yeah. Excuse me. And uh, yeah. it's very interesting in government and accountability and transparency. I'm sorry we're not going to be able to see the rest of uh, your presentation. It looked very interesting. Um, when thinking about our uh, discussion about lobbying, <coughs> Uh, it seems to me the key to the success of traditional lobbying has been a lack of transparency and the inability for the public to be aware of who is taking money from whom. And moving forward, I mean, with all the scandals we're seeing now every day, it's someone new, um, it seems that lobbying activities like junkets to Scotland or the Cayman Islands are going to become less and less uh, viable methods for, for lobbying policymakers. Um, and it seems like, uh, due in large part, I think, to a lot of the transparency measures that so I'm wondering if you think this is going to prove to be a radical change for the lobbying field, and if that's part of why you're encouraging nonprofits to get involved. Yeah, yeah. I think I think transparency is not a solution. Transparency is the tool for solutions that occur by. And and I think uh, new technologies, in the same way, are empowering tools to get you there. It's it's remarkable that an organization like ONG Watch that has a progressive tilt is buddy up with the Bush administration on some of these transparencies around government spending. Um, I mean, we, we look at who passed the law. It was Senator Barack Obama, it was Senator Tom Coburn. Coburn is one of the most right, and one would argue that Obama is among the most left. They partnered to get a law through that said, make all government spending available online in a searchable format. And when government said it couldn't be done, measly little ONB watch went and did it and showed it could. And we did it with foundation funding. And now the government took our website to do theirs. That's a real win. I mean, that's incredible for a, roughly a $200,000 grant. That's a social entrepreneur who scaled up. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do one more. You had a question. Um, uh, thank you so much for being here. It's been really very interesting. Um, today we've discussed a lot about the trends, or hopefully soon to be emerging trends, for the nonprofit grant making community in the United States. But have you noticed at all any international trends of what foundations headquartered in other countries have been doing with relationships to their respective governments? And if there's anything that the foundations within the United States can learn from that process? I'm or, refer to both Joel and Ed and others in the room. I just don't know international plans to be well enough. You know? It varies uh, from country to country. If, uh, in some countries, it's virtually none. Israel, for example, is absolutely prohibitive. Uh, and, but on the other hand, you know, there are foundations in the uh, such as one of the Cadbury foundations, that Cadbury of the chocolates. Mm -hmm. um, they set up two foundations. One of them is governed strictly by the Chinese Commission, and one of them is a foundation without any tax benefits. I mean, it's just that they set it up, and that foundation does a lot of lobbying. And that, in fact, that's the reason they set it up that way. It was set up so that it could lobby, because it's not, it isn't tax exempt, basically. And there's no deduction, no gifts. They, they, they didn't have at that point any much gifts, much deduction for gifts anyway. But, so that there, in France, Because of the fact that, that every foundation board has a politically appointed representative on it, so they're not going to they're not going to be in favor of, do, of initiatives to change government policy because they are government, <laughs> and we all know what's happening in Russia, you know, where where the government is bearing down very very hard on all charities, including foundations, putting them through an, a new review, and and any organization that is the slightest bit anti-government or exists for the purpose of changing public, public policy is not going to be approved. It's not, going to, it's not going to be in existence. So, you know, we are fortunate in, this, in the U.S. that foundations and nonprofits can do this kind of thing because we've 
about the First Amendment, and they're free to do what they want to do. But in, in many of the countries in the world, Germany is another example. Germany is very hard to get approval to be a, 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 a foundation or a nonprofit. Very stringent with upfront review before you get certified as a patent organization. Japan is exactly the same way. So, you know, we are lucky with the First Amendment because we can do these things. Most of the country is simply not there. Joel? I'm just going to say, would you say, though, recognizing that uh, it's some explosion, there's a thousand new nonprofits a day in this country or something, and many of them, the 501c3 charitable variety, I mean, is it too easy? I mean, are, are there too many fractured, you know, there's 27 social service organizations trying to feed the homeless in Durham. I mean, is that, should they be talking? Should it's a problem that, it's a problem, but I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to try to restrict it. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the glory of the American nonprofit sector. The fact is that anybody can do what they damn well please. And the consequence is we've got a million, about at this point we've got two million nonprofit organizations, including both the charitable ones that we talked about, that is where the gifts are deductible, and the non-charitable ones where they're not. And you think about two million organizations with average board size of something like 20 members of the board. You multiply that out and think about all the different values and diversity in race and ethnicity and everything else in these organizations coming to bear on public on public problems and, and speaking out and doing things. That's amazing. But assuming they are. You also said well, that only 10% really know what the hell the board's about. They have the potential, they have the potential yeah. to do it. The values are there and they're, and they're active. You know, the values are trying to expression in diverse ways even if they don't get involved in advocacy. But it gives you some sense of the extent to which if they could be organized and mobilized they could be tremendously, and it would be a wonderful, diverse, rainbow chorus of the whole country. Yeah. That, that can't happen in most places. I'm pretty sure it's not the same 20 individuals. Joel's <laughs> 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 vision is why I do the work I do, mm -hmm. because I think we can make our democracy better, and that's the role, from, from my point of view, of what the nonprofit sector should be about. It's not only doing the service that we may be doing, our mission, but it's something bigger than that. And it's and it's something that is a gestalt. When somehow we work together and create something bigger than what any of us alone do, that's what makes this an incredible place to live. You know, that's the exciting thing. That's that's what drives me. You know, and I, I agree, Joel, I'm not gonna agree with you, maybe, you know, well, ninety-nine out of <laughs> because I'm better. <laughs> but, but, you know, that isn't the objective. We don't have to all do it in unison. We don't have to sing the same song. That's what's exciting. Yeah, I, I, I just have the one, maybe when you were speaking, it reminded me of a funny story that happened to me. How many of you have been to D.C.? Okay, how many of you have ridden our subway, our metro? Okay, well, you know, if you uh, burp, you go to jail, right? And it's, our subway is real quiet. Right, you know, you gotta be real polite. And I do like every Metro rider. I immediately get in and bury my head down like I'm reading, right? You know, and so I ignore everyone. And I had one of those situations where I was at one end of the car, buried my head, and I heard from the other end, hey Gary. Oh, please don't be me, you know. <laughs> and, and she goes, Gary! And I go, hey, you know, and this was a few years ago. And she goes, Hey, did you hear what they did? And this was an, an omnibus bill doing nursing home reform, reform, and she's going on about all these changes in nursing reform, nursing home reform. And we're going along, and we're heading towards Crystal City, Pentagon, we're heading towards, all these people are getting off and talking about the crazy lady and nursing home reform. <laughs> and, and we get to the airport, and I get off to her, and I said, do you know, I realize this is kind of a game she's playing, you know? I said, you do this often. She goes, oh, yes, you should get them in an elevator, they got no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, that's, that's what get that's Yeah, we gotta get them in the elevators again. That's what it's about. Yeah. Well, I mean, can I add Joel. just a postscript here, which is I, I, I would love to have Jay Hamilton talk sometime about, he's thought a lot about the role of nonprofits and community foundations in information uh, and, the, and the, the potential role. I mean, you think about the, the tragic problems that newspapers are having in keeping, developing a good business model. Well, you know, the truth is that, that and he's been thinking about and working on the question of, I uh, don't want to describe, I don't know, can't give you, give you much detail, but at some point, 
talking about the role of nonprofits in uh, in supporting, maybe even owning newspapers, community information um, uh, facilitation. He's been working with the Knight Foundation and some of the things that they've been talking about doing on getting diverse information out to communities and connect them up more. Right? That's a promo for a conference we're going to have this week. Oh, really? Yes, we are going to try to examine that because what we've been talking about in information circulating these lobbies, but of course, nonprofits are foundations, but also either subsidize reporting or actually handing out that. Uh, and Tom Friedman was here on Monday, mm -hmm. and he said in 15 years, he didn't even see a world where the New York Times was owned by a foundation. Wow. So we're going to uh, look at that. It's not that long. long. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me close by that uh, with one observation and a, a big thank you. Um, one of the things that we didn't touch on here, but which builds from it or, or certainly straddles these issues, is the whole uh, bursting out of what's called Web 2.0 or social media or whatever you talk about and how technology and new kinds of communication, obviously, are reshaping two generations get their information differently, and for whom charitable giving, marketing, and certainly political activity you know, may well be mediated through a cell phone. And so this Web 2.0 stuff um, may be right for us to have another dialogue about uh, in terms of how public policy can, is being, and may well be influenced by new forces of social networking that are just, just exploding with um, so we've got 50 different angles, lots to talk about. Uh, let me thank Gary very much for being with us.